So one thing true about every kind of person from every kind of culture is that, is that when we eat food, most often we, we eat food with others. Okay, people tend to eat food with other people, which is no surprise to us. We, we do this all the time. This, this is a human thing that we eat with others, which is why, just to be clear, just so you know, if, if you eat Taco Bell by yourself in your car five days a week, you're doing it wrong, okay? A couple of days a week is okay, but if you're in that five-day-a-week pattern, you, 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 know, you need to change that, okay? Sharing meals with others is a good thing. And what's best about, we just, Melissa and I were just, I think we, we had dinner with folks for the last maybe 10 days, I think we, we've, we've eaten with other people. And uh, it's just, it's the, the best thing about it, sharing meals, is that it's not the food so much, it's, it's the conversation that happens around the food, right? And, and, and usually when you share meals, it's, it's not just the conversation while you eat, it's really the conversation after you're done eating, right? Especially if you have kids. If you have, if you have kids, you know, dinner is more like, it's about survival, you know. <laughs> they got to eat, you got to eat, you know, you're just trying to make it, trying to get through. And, uh, and then once the kids are finished and, and once you've sprayed them off and put them to bed and, and mopped and scrubbed the floor around where they sat, uh, at least for Melissa and me, that's when we have some of our best conversations. And when we have friends over, sometimes we can, we can talk for hours, and, and those are good times for us. Those, those are sweet times. So just think about for a minute in your own life, like the times that you've had dinner with friends. Think about having dinner with friends. Think, think about all the after dinner conversations that you've had. Those are sweet times. That's where friendship happens. After dinner conversations are some of the most important times in our lives. And that's absolutely the case here in John 15. Because here in John 15, the setting of John 15 goes back to John 13, where Jesus is in Jerusalem with his disciples. It's Thursday night, the day before Jesus is going to be crucified. And Jesus and his disciples are having dinner together. And everything that we read from chapter 13, verse 4, all the way through chapter 17, is the conversation that happens after that dinner. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, he leaves the dinner in chapter 13, verse 30, he's gone. So by the end of chapter 13, verses 31 and following, what we're reading about is a conversation that Jesus is having with his 11 closest friends. And so Pastor David last week, Pastor David preached in chapter 14, and he mentioned how there were different disciples who were joining in this conversation with Jesus. There were different disciples taking turns, asking Jesus questions. First it was Peter, and then it was Thomas, and then it was Philip, and then in verse 22, it was the other Judas, uh, not Iscariot, the other Judas. And just so you can get the image right in your minds, the reason that these disciples are taking these turns asking questions is because they're all sitting around a table together, right? That's, that's the image. They're all sitting at the dinner table after dinner, and they're taking turns asking Jesus questions. And John, the disciple who wrote this gospel, he's sitting there too. And we read in chapter 13 that John is actually sitting next to Jesus. So he's sitting next to Jesus. He, he remembers all of this. And so he writes it down here in this gospel. And so when we read this gospel, when we read chapter 15, it's almost like we get to be part of that same after dinner conversation. And what Jesus says here in these few chapters, ending with, with his prayer in chapter 17, th this is, he makes this, Jesus makes this the greatest after dinner conversation ever had. This is epic. This is the greatest after dinner conversation ever. And this morning, I want us to look at it. Chapter 15 is going to be our focus. But chapter 15 is just a continuation of what we saw last week in chapter 14. Jesus, as Pastor David mentioned, he is, he is meaning, he's intending to speak words of comfort to his disciples. That's the theme of what's going on here. He says it twice. Jesus says it twice in chapter 14, verse 1. In chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Which means that Jesus is saying things here to comfort the disciples' hearts, not trouble their hearts. And even more than that, in chapter 15, verse 11, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, 
that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So this is amazing, okay? Think about it for a minute. For context, so you can, so you can get the scene right in your mind, in your imagination. What we're reading here in John 15 is Jesus talking with his closest friends after dinner and he's saying what he's saying so that they will have the fullest experience of joy they have ever known. Which means, at least for me, like, I want to know what he's saying, right? Don't you? Like, I want to know what Jesus is saying here in John 15. And so that's what we're going to look at. Uh, 15 verse 1 is the last I am statement in the gospel of John. We've been doing this I am series. This is the last one. And Jesus says there, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. So the last image Jesus gives us here, he goes all horticultural on us, okay? Jesus claims to be a vine. And he says that we're branches. The father is a garden. There are three parts to the image he gives us here. There's the vine, which is himself. There's the vine dresser or the gardener, which is God the father. And then there's us, his disciples, who Jesus says are the branches. And each of these three parts are all connected and, and they each play different roles. And so I want to this morning stay within this metaphor. I want to stick to this image. And I want us to look at three things that Jesus tells us about these three parts. And so for the outline of the sermon, here, here it is. Jesus this morning is telling us three encouraging truths in John 15. Number one, the focus is the vine. Number two, abiding makes the difference. And then number three, the gardener gets the glory. And the plan is to just walk through each of these three truths. And before we do that, I want to pray. Ask for God's help. Father, I ask this morning for your spirit to work. Work here in me. Work in all of us gathered. Give us a, an unusual focus, attention to what it is that you're saying here. We want to know what it is that, that, that you're saying. So help us, we ask, for your glory and our good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the main thing we need to know, number one, is the first thing that Jesus says. The focus is on the vine. Okay, the main thing we need to know is the first thing Jesus says. Jesus says, verse one, that he is the true vine. And in verse five, he says it again. Jesus is the vine. And I don't know what you think about when you think about vines, but I think about my grandmother. Okay, I call her nanny. I think about my nanny. And the reason that I think about Nanny is because when I, was, uh, when I was 18 and leaving home for school, I grew up, my grandparents lived in the house right beside ours, so I grew up with my grandparents and cousins. And when, when I moved away from school, my grandmother, Nanny, gave me a devotional book to read that had this uh, gardening theme to it. It was, it, was a, it was a devotional book that had all this gardening imagery, and, uh, which was kind of odd for an 18-year-old kid, but... What made it special to me is that my nanny read the book before me, the entire thing, and she, she wrote notes to me in the book on every page. And so I read, the, I read the whole thing, and it was amazing. God used that book to get me into John 15, and then God used John 15 to change my life. And, and the thing is, though, I didn't know anything about gardening. I still don't know anything about gardening. In fact, I, I can't even grow grass in my yard, okay? It's, 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 it's these kids, y'all. Like, literally, I just unloaded two tons of playground gravel in the backyard. I just, just dumped it, just covered the grass up because I can't grow it. And so I don't know, maybe you, maybe you love the garden, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe and that's, that's great. But the, the, the good thing about it is that you don't really have to know anything about gardening to understand what Jesus is saying because Jesus is doing something more than giving us a gardening metaphor here. What Jesus says, when Jesus says that he is the true vine, he's actually making a critical allusion to the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, especially in the prophetic books like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, the metaphor of a vine is used over and over again to represent the people of Israel, which is God's chosen people. And so what Jesus is doing, doing here when he calls himself a vine, he, he's not really trying to connect with you and your garden, okay? What Jesus is doing is he is connecting himself 
to this image that we read about in the Old Testament. And what's really interesting about this image, every time it's used in the Old Testament in reference to Israel, is that it's negative. I'm going to read you a couple examples, but the gist of it is this. The, re- the reason it's negative is because we, we, we learn, we read that God chose Israel. God planted Israel to be a vine that produces good fruit. But Israel failed to do that. And so because Israel failed to be a vine that produces good fruit, God brings judgment on Israel. So listen, listen now. I'm going to read a couple of places to you. First, Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah 2, 19 to 21. I'm just going to read it. This is God speaking to Israel. Okay, and it's like, it's PG-13. Okay, so hang tight. God says, your evil will chastise you and your apostasy will reprove you. Know and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God. The fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. For long ago, I broke your yoke and burst your bonds, but you said, I will not serve. Yes, on every high hill and under every green tree, you have bowed down like a whore. Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? They rejected God. Ezekiel chapter 19, this is verses 10 to 13. This is a lament about Israel from the prophet Ezekiel. This is what he says. He says, your mother, Israel, your mother was like a vine in the vineyard planted by water, by the water, fruitful and full of branches by reason of abundant water. Its strong stems became rulers, scepters. It towered aloft among the thick boughs. It was seen in its height with the mass of its branches. But the vine was plucked up in fury, cast down to the ground. The east wind dried up his fruit. They were stripped off and withered. As for its strong stem, fire consumed it. Now it is planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty land. Talking about Israel and captivity here. They were enslaved again, okay? This is, not, this is not good stuff for Israel. Israel was not the vine that God intended Israel to be. Israel failed. Israel did not produce good fruit. So why then is Jesus coming here in John 15, why is he claiming to be the vine? Well, it's because Jesus is saying that where Israel failed, he will not fail. Jesus, he says, is the true vine, which means that Jesus is the truer and better Israel. So in all the places where Israel wavered, Jesus will hold fast. In all the places where Israel sinned, Jesus will overcome. In all the places where Israel forsook God over and over again, Jesus will trust God all the way to the end. And so this illusion that Jesus is making, this connection to the Old Testament sets up the whole trajectory of this conversation he's having in John 15. He's going to talk about the branches. He's going to talk about the gardener. But what he says here is what makes all that other stuff make sense. We will not understand anything else he says unless we understand that the focus is on the vine. The focus of this whole conversation is that everything about the world and everything about God's history with humanity is now changed because of Jesus. Jesus came to this earth to be the true and better Israel that Israel felt to be. And Jesus came to this earth to be the true and better human that all of us felt to be. And that's not just a side note to who Jesus is. It's at the very heart of his rescue mission. Because what we need, what you and I need, is not just a savior who can can get us out of trouble. We need a savior who can walk through life in our shoes, going through all the things that we go through, but yet perfectly trust God and always do what he says and love others even when it's hard and then take all of that righteousness, all of that perfection, all of that power and then give it to us. That's what we need. And that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus has done. 
Jesus just doesn't give us his death. He just didn't die for us. Jesus lived for us. And all of his righteousness, all of his perfection, all of his holiness, he gives to us. Jesus gives us his fruitfulness. That's what it means for Jesus to be the true vine. And abiding in him is what makes the difference. Okay, so this is the second truth to look at. Number one, the focus is on the vine. Number two, abiding makes the difference. Now, Jesus, with himself as the focus, he talks about the branches, okay? The, the, the vines have branches. And in this image, Jesus says that we, those who trust him, are the, are the branches. Jesus' disciples, us, are the branches of the vine. And right away, Jesus also mentions the gardener, which is God the Father. He comes into view, verse 1. The gardener is the one who, who works to take care of the branches on the vine. Okay, he's the one who's tending and keeping the vine. And look what Jesus says in verse 2. This is what the gardener, the gardener does this, the, God the Father. Every branch in me, verse 2, that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. So Jesus now gives us two categories, okay? There are the unfruitful branches, and then there are the fruitful branches. And the fruitful branches are the ones that are pruned so that they would produce more fruit. And... And sometimes when we read this text, at least for me, or may, maybe you've heard it taught this way before, we can get caught up with an anxiety when we read this. And we wonder, man, oh, no, are we, are we the good branches or the bad branches? Like, are we the unfruitful branches or are we the fruitful branches? I've, I've, I've heard this passage taught before where the central message was a warning that the branches better be fruitful or you're going to be thrown away and put in fire. That's the way I've heard it taught before. And so I want to just be clear here that that is not at all what Jesus is doing in this text. Okay. Remember, Jesus told his disciples twice, let not your hearts be troubled. Jesus says in verse 11, that everything that he's saying here, everything he's been saying here is so that the disciples would have the fullness of joy. So Jesus is not warning his disciples here. And he does warn his disciples. Jesus does, in the Bible, warn his disciples. He just doesn't do it here. In this text, Jesus is encouraging his disciples. He is speaking comforting words to his disciples. And in case we don't see that, he makes it super clear in verse 3. Okay, verse 2. Remember, verse 2, category of fruitful branches. The fruitful branches produce fruit. They're pruned, okay? Okay. Well, verse 3, Jesus says, already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. And when Jesus says the word here, clean, he means prune, okay? The fruitful branches are the prune branches. And Jesus says in verse, in verse 3, already you are clean or already you are pruned. It's the same Greek word, okay? Uh, uh, prune, the verb is kathare, clean is katharoi, okay? It's just a verb in and out, the exact same word in the original language. And, and we use the word clean this way too. Like we, we use the word clean to refer to this sort of thing. Uh, I was going to say, where's David Olson if he's in here? David Olson, Deacon Olson, we call him. Uh, lives a couple, couple blocks from us now. He's got this chainsaw on a pole that, that uh, is you, you extend the thing and you, you can get like branches from your tree, okay? And, uh, and I got a tree, a maple tree in my front yard that's got some branches high up that are hanging way too far down and uh, hangs over our cars, hit it when we, so, uh, so David, last week, he came, he came over with his chainsaw on a pole and he took the chainsaw and he, he cleaned up my tree for me. You know what I mean by that, right? He trimmed it. He, he took his little chainsaw, on the pole, and he, he trimmed it, he pruned it, he cleaned the tree for me. And that's exactly what Jesus is saying here when Jesus says that you're clean. He's telling the disciples that they have been pruned. They have been clean. He is assuring his disciples then that they are not going to be cast off. His disciples are not going to be thrown into the fire. Because remember, Judas Iscariot is not sitting here. Judas Iscariot has already left. In chapter 13... He, he, he left the scene. He was already cut off. 
Judas Iscariot has already now been thrown into the trash. He's out of the picture. Right now in this passage, Jesus in chapter 15 is speaking to his disciples and he is comforting his disciples by telling them that he has pruned them. He has cleaned them. The the vine dresser, the father, the gardener has pruned them. You're in is what he's saying to these guys sitting there with him. These disciples are good, fruitful branches because they are part of the vine. Which he explains means they abide in him. Verse 4, Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So, So simply put, the branch is impossible without the vine. There, there is no such thing as a branch by itself. There's, there's no such thing as a branch just sitting around by itself producing fruit. It doesn't happen. Branches only bear fruit when they are connected to the vine. And, and Jesus says it's the same way with him. And he makes it clear in the next verse. Again, verse five, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. So in the same way that a branch is connected to a vine, in the same way that just as a branch has its meaning and sustenance and life and fruit in the vine, Jesus' disciples abide in him. Verse 6, Jesus says that if you don't abide in him, you're thrown away, and you're used in a bonfire. You're thrown away you're in a big bonfire. Because if you don't abide in Jesus, you're not a branch producing fruit. You're a dead stick. And dead sticks are used for bonfires. Judas. Okay? But abiding in Jesus is what makes the difference. If you don't abide in Jesus, you're not part of this thing, okay? But if you do abide in Jesus, if you abide in Jesus, you are a branch of the vine and you are producing fruit, which means a couple of things, right? We need to know now, what does it mean to abide and what does it mean to produce fruit? What is fruit? What is, what is abiding and what is fruit? Okay, we have to understand these two things if we're going to understand the passage. So let's look first at what does it mean to abide? I think visually this makes sense to us, okay? In the same way that a branch is connected to a vine, to abide is to stay. To to abide is to stay connected. And I think think we can imagine that. We can see that with our, our minds, but it still doesn't really get at what exactly does it mean to abide. But a little later in verse nine, Jesus says this. He says, abide in my love. And then he explains that if you keep my commandments, you abide in my love. And so now you have Jesus and you have his love and you have keeping his commandments. And all three of these things, uh, they say something about what it means to abide, which I think actually simplifies it for us. Okay, just let's not overcomplicate what Jesus is saying here. Abiding is just another way for Jesus to talk about faith. To abide in Jesus is to have faith in Jesus. And we're not too surprised to hear that in the Gospel of John because we've already seen in this Gospel all kinds of creative ways to describe what it means to believe in Jesus. For example, in chapter 6, believing in Jesus means to eat his flesh and drink his blood. That's one way, that's one way it's it's explained to believe in Jesus, which means all these ways of talking about faith are meant to deepen faith. These pictures are meant to deepen the meaning of faith. So for, for whatever categories we have of faith being like some type of mere, you know, check of a box, this gospel shatters those categories. Okay? Faith is deep. It has meaning faith is more than sending Jesus a thumbs up emoji. It's more than that. Faith is deeply relational. Faith 
is holding on and hiding in. It's, it's clinging tight and standing firm. It's eating your fill and drinking your heart out. It's digging your heels in when it seems like the ground beneath your feet is shaking. You just grab onto Jesus with all your soul, even when you know that your embrace is as pathetic as a mustard seed. You embrace Jesus until your knuckles turn white and you lose all the feeling in your hands. And whatever you do, you do not let go of Jesus. You do not let go of him. Whatever you do, you do not let go of Jesus because he's not letting you go. And that's what the embrace is about. That's what you know. If you have faith in Jesus, if you embrace Jesus, you know it's not so much about your embrace. It's about his embrace of you. It's about the fact that he is not going to let you go. And so you hold on to that. You cling to him. That's what faith is. It's you knowing when everything around you is crumbling, you cling tight to him because you know he will not let you go. And if you're there right now, if it feels like you're losing your grip, if it feels like you're drifting, hold on. God, please hold on. He is not going to let you go. He will not let you go. He will not let you go. Hold on to him. Cling tight to him. That's what faith is. And that's where this image of a vine is so helpful because th there's a vital union between a vine and its branches, right? And in the same way, there's a vital union between Jesus and those who trust him. We, we, don't, we can't. We can't stand back away from Jesus and just send him our faith. Our faith in Jesus means that we are inseparably connected to him so much so that there is no such thing as me apart from him. He says in verse 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. And the truth is, apart from him, we are nothing. We are nothing. That's what it means to be the branches of the vine. There are no branches without the vine. That's what abiding in Jesus looks like. You know that. We get that. That's what it means to believe in him. Which, in case you're wondering right now whether or not you abide in him, if you've been thinking, if you've been mulling this over in your head as I've been talking, and you're wondering whether or not you're a fruitful branch, the answer is, is to trust him right now. Believe in him. Believe in him. Put your faith in Jesus. Believing in Jesus is what it means to abide in Jesus. And if you abide in Jesus, you will be fruitful. So what does fruitful mean? If you abide in Jesus, you will be fruitful. So now what does fruitful mean? I think Jesus tells us in this passage. Okay, look at verse 7. Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, hold on for a second. Jesus said this, remember, in verse 4. Okay, in verse 4, same thing. Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you in order to be fruitful. And here in verse 7, it's, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Which means he's talking about answered prayer. That's what he's saying. That's answered prayer is what he's talking about. Okay. So abiding in Jesus in verse 4 means fruitfulness. Abiding in Jesus in verse 7 means answered prayer. And I don't think he's talking about two different things here. I think he's talking about the same thing. We see it again in verse 16. It shows up again. Look at verse 16. This is a little bit ahead of where we are. Verse 16, this is what Jesus says. He says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. So here in one verse, bearing fruit that remains is equated with answer prayer. 
The verse goes like this. Jesus, Jesus chose you and appointed you so that you would bear fruit, which is to say, so that your prayers would be answered, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, I'll give it to you. Fruitfulness then, in the passage, fruitfulness then, according to what Jesus says, is answer prayer. Fruitfulness is answer prayer. And I think there is so much here with this. There's a lot, there's a lot here. This is, this is dense, okay? Um, but one of the problems that we have, I think, one of the problems that, that I think happens when we think about fruitfulness is that um, uh, when, we, when we identify fruitfulness as one thing, we can tend to reduce it down to that one thing, that one single thing, and that one single thing gets all the attention, and we just think, man, we just have to do this one thing. I think this text has been misunderstood that way before, right? We have, we have, we have this tendency. I, I have it. I've, I've read this text this way. We, we have a tendency to reduce fruitfulness down to one thing. We'll say, oh, fruitfulness is obedience, or no, 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 fruitfulness is new believers, or no, fruitfulness is moral character, right? That's, we, we tend to like try to say it's one, one thing. That's what fruitfulness is. That's what we got to have. I don't, I don't think that's what Jesus is doing, okay? So for how you envision it, for how you, in your imagination, fruitfulness is not a bowl of grapes, okay? It's not what it is. Instead, fruitfulness is a lush, bountiful orchard of fruit. So how does fruitfulness being answered prayer do that? How does fruitfulness being answered prayer not reduce fruitfulness down to one thing? Well, it's because answered prayer becomes the vista through which we see the bountiful manifestation of God's work in our lives. Because that's what we pray for, right? See, fruitfulness being answered prayer only reduces what fruitfulness is if we've already reduced what prayer is. We do that. If we think of prayer, if we think of answered prayer as only when God, you know, gives us those big things we pray for every two or three years, if that's what answered prayer is to us, we just got a bowl of grapes. It's just a bowl of grapes, okay? But answered prayer is so much more than that. See, I think sometimes when we, when we read verses like John 15, 7, where Jesus tells us, ask anything and it will be done for you, we tend to put Jesus on the hot seat. We, we, we think, I mean, really, Jesus? Are you being, are you being serious here, Jesus? Anything? You know, that's, that's kind of what, what we do. We, we read this passage, we read these verses, and we, we tend to scrutinize Jesus. But hold on a minute, right? Let's turn the tables on ourselves. The real question is, what are we asking for? What are we praying for? Jesus said he would give us Whatever we ask. So are we asking for his kingdom to come? Are we asking for the sun to rise and for the heavens to declare his glory? Are we asking for his spirit to strengthen us? Are we asking for him to give us the power to understand his grace more deeply? Are we asking for him to keep us every night? Now I lay me down to sleep. Lord, I pray my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, Lord, I pray my soul to take. God has answered that prayer every single time I pray it, every night. God, 32, God has answered that prayer thousands of times for me, thousands of times. Every time I pray it, God answers that prayer. And one morning, whenever that morning comes and I don't wake up, he still will have answered that prayer. See, the more, the more we pray God's will, it means the more answered prayer becomes every little way that we experience and comprehend the activity of God in our lives. Answered prayer becomes every good thing that God is doing in your life. So fruitfulness being answered prayer doesn't reduce fruitfulness, it expands it. Yes, it's obedience. It is. And it's love. And it's patience. And it's witness. 
and its endurance. Fruitfulness is every way that God is working in and through your lives because that is what we're praying for. And that's what it means to be a branch connected to the vine. It means God's at work in you. God's doing stuff in you. And it's the gardener who gets the glory. That's the third point, final point. The gardener gets the glory. Jesus mentions God the Father right away in verse 1. And uh, we, we learn the Father, the gardener, the vine dresser, he's the one tending the vine, he's doing the pruning, he's cleaning it up. And when it comes to answer prayer, verse 8, when it, when it comes to fruitfulness, Jesus says, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So this is easy to get, right? Look, the one who tends to the branches of the vine, he's glorified when those branches produce fruit. So, so God the Father, he wants to see his work displayed in your life because he is glorified by his work displayed in your life. I mean, this is as good as it gets, right? I mean, God wants to see things happen in your life. He wants to see good come to your life. He, he wants to see you producing fruit. He wants to be active in all the details of your everyday. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to produce fruit. Because when you produce fruit, when God's at work in your life, even in the smallest ways, even when it's, I believe in again. I woke up again. I fell asleep. I just woke up. It happens every day. I just wake up. The sun, look, the sun, it, it came up again. I, I'm not, gravity still works. Like all these things, the breeze, the sun, all these things, all these things. When we live in a way of gratitude, of, of seeing God at work in these ways, God's glorifying that. That is fruitfulness in our life. That's a bountiful orchard of fruit. And God is glorified in that, even in the smallest ways, even in the littlest things that God is doing in your life, God is glorified in that because it says something wonderful about him. It magnifies him. It glorifies him. And so the disciples were sitting around this table, right? This is the after dinner conversation they're having with Jesus, this epic after dinner conversation. And, and maybe their heads were spinning just a little bit, right? I mean, maybe this is a lot. Okay, Jesus, um, but Jesus says, I, I'm telling you guys this because I want you to have joy. He's telling us this because he wants us to have his joy in us, which means he wants us to have the fullest experience of joy. There is full joy. And I think this truth about the Father is a cause of joy. Because what it means is that this whole thing is the Father's doing. This is God's doing. All of this, the whole thing, God has done it all. We're just branches, man. You know, think about it. We're just branches. We're just branches on a vine that is truer and better than anything that we could ever dream of. We're just glad to be here, right? We're just, we're just glad to be here. We are part of something that is so much bigger than us, so, so much beyond us, and so much not up to us. It's up to the Father. This is the Father's thing. The Father is handling all of this, and so the Father gets the glory, and that gives us joy. And it's in that joy that we come to the table today. You know, the Lord's table is a, it's a sobering table because at this table, we, we remember the death of Jesus. We remember that Jesus died for us. But in another sense, this is a happy table. This is a table of joy because the Bible tells us that Jesus willingly died for us. Hebrews says that, that for the joy set before him, for the joy set before him, Jesus went to the cross. There is a deeper, fuller experience of joy that Jesus wants us to have. And that's where we're headed. That's where he is taking us. And that's what we remember here at the table. So the band and the servers can come forward and prepare the table. I'm going to pray and then we'll serve. Jesus, we do ask, King, 
we ask that you would give us that joy you talk about here. We want your joy to be in us. And we want our joy to be full. And there's, we got all eternity, right, to talk about that and learn about that. It's a whole other sermon. What does it mean to have your joy in us, this joy that you've had with the Father before all eternity? What does it mean to have that joy in us? We want that. We, we ask for that. Do that in us. Work that in us by your Spirit. Even now as we come to this table with grateful hearts for what you've done in your death and resurrection. Thank you for going to the cross in our place, for bearing our sins, for suffering the wrath that we deserve. Thank you for being raised from the dead, victorious over sin and death. And thank you for giving us, Jesus, your righteousness and the forgiveness for all our sins. We celebrate that now in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. So we do this move every week for the members of our church. But if you're here and, and you are united to Jesus by faith, if you're here and you abide in Jesus, we want to invite you to, to eat and to drink with us. We're going to serve the bread first. Just kind of just hold it and then I'll come back up and we'll eat together. If, if you prefer gluten-free, just raise your hand. I'll have the gluten-free bowl. I'll get it to you. Uh, his body is the true bread. Let us serve you.